I'm delighted to announce that my new book, Principles of Economics, is now available. You can order the hardcover and the ebook now from my website, safeaddeen.com, and it will be available from June 21 from Amazon and online and offline bookshops worldwide. Principles of Economics is a university level textbook offering a comprehensive, engaging, and easy to read overview of the field of economics that is valuable to the university student, general reader, and professional economist. This book is the culmination of four years of hard work and 20 years of learning and teaching economics at university level. It is everything I wish I had in a university economics textbook. Rather than confuse the reader with arcane theoretical models and irrelevant analysis of aggregates, this book is unapologetically Austrian in its approach, using the clear written word to introduce the principles, methods, and concepts of economics in a readable, engaging, and informative manner. You can also get the ebook by becoming a member of SafeAddeen.com, where you can join our weekly seminars, which discuss economics, Bitcoin, and much more, and also host special guests, which you can listen to in this podcast's episodes. The Bitcoin Standard Podcast is brought to you by CrowdHealth. CrowdHealth is the Bitcoiner's answer to fiat health insurance. If you listen to this show, you've probably heard me rail against the problems of modern healthcare and health insurance. CrowdHealth is a brilliant new solution to this problem that leverages the power of Bitcoin to help people get affordable healthcare. CrowdHealth holds its cash reserves in Bitcoin. It negotiates with healthcare providers on your behalf and gets you much better rates by offering to pay them cash upfront without having to go through the expensive bureaucracy of modern healthcare insurance. It's a solution that works better for healthcare providers and for patients by disintermediating large insurance companies who have the wrong incentives and are constantly raising costs. I'm very happy to have signed up for CrowdHealth and I'm really excited to support them as they disrupt the fiat health insurance industry. Go to joincrowdhealth.com and use the discount code SAFE, S-A-I-F, and you'll get the first six months for $99 only. Coinbits. Coinbits is a great way to introduce your pre-coin or friends and family to Bitcoin. Get them set up in under a minute and help kickstart their journey by turning everyday spare change into Bitcoin. This Bitcoin-only app takes the uncertainty and fear out of Bitcoin saving by rounding up debit and credit card purchases to the nearest dollar, then using the difference to buy Bitcoin. Set it, forget it, and let the app automatically tax your high-time preference spending by saving the hardest money ever. Want to save in Bitcoin faster? Customers can multiply their roundups up to 10x or adjust their savings frequency for weekly or daily Bitcoin stacking. Coinbits is built on a sound, tried and true dollar cost averaging strategy that turns Bitcoin's volatility in your favor. Once you've gotten a private wallet set up, Coinbits encourages you to withdraw your Bitcoin to your own private wallet and embrace the Bitcoin standard way of life. Start stacking on coinbitsapp.com and save your time and energy in the soundest money ever. The Bitcoin Standard Podcast is brought to you by CoinKite. CoinKite are my favorite makers of Bitcoin hard. They produce the legendary Open Dime, the first Bitcoin bearer asset, as well as the reliable cold card hardware wallet, the excellent stainless steel seed plates for storing your seed phrases, and the block clock. Now, CoinKite have produced the SATS card, a card the size of a credit card which can store Bitcoin and works great as a gift. CoinKite have just produced a limited edition gorgeous Bitcoin standard SATS card, which carries the Bitcoin standard logo, and you can get it from coinkite.shop slash Bitcoin standard. Use the code Bitcoin standard to get 5% off your purchase. Get paid in Bitcoin regardless of who you work for and regardless of who is paying you. All thanks to a premium service I personally love and use, and that is Bitwage. Thanks to Bitwage, I receive my books royalties in Bitcoin. It is cheaper, faster, and easier. It is a true set it and forget it system. And Bitwage has been offering this premium service since 2014. Anyone can sign up and use it right away. No restrictions or limits. Fully non-custodial. You can even split your incoming payment. Get part in Bitcoin and part to a bank account you specify. It could not be easier and I cannot recommend Bitwage highly enough. Go to bitwage.com and sign up now and get paid in Bitcoin with your next payment or salary. Hello, welcome to another episode of the Bitcoin Standard Podcast. Our guest today is John Dennehy. John is the founder of My First Bitcoin, or Mi Primer Bitcoin. It's a Bitcoin education nonprofit based in El Salvador. The project has taught over 20,000 students, including the first students anywhere in the world, to ever receive a Bitcoin diploma program in a public school system. It has open sourced all of its educational materials and has ambitious plans to teach millions of students in El Salvador and beyond. I met John on my recent trip to El Salvador, and I'm excited about having him on the podcast to tell us about uh, Bitcoin education, how they do it, 
what lessons they've learned and uh, how he recommends you go about it. So John, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's good, good to see you again. Likewise. So let's first get started with uh, you and your backstory. What got you into the Bitcoin rabbit hole? Mm, yeah, Bitcoin is such a fascinating thing because we all have we all have our own stories that are all like worlds in them in themselves. I I first heard of Bitcoin in 2013 with uh, when there was a Cyprus bell in with the banks there. I read an article about it and there was a line in it that said. Bitcoin users unaffected or something and Bitcoin price has gone up because of this. And I was like, wait, what price has gone up? So I looked into it um, and immediately, you know, was drawn to the idea. Uh, so a little bit of background before that, I had I had lived in Ecuador maybe six or seven years before that and a new government took over and they didn't recognize the visa of the previous government. And I ended up getting deported because of it. And I had a bank account in Ecuador and they in, in that process, they they seized my assets, right? They like froze my bank account. I was very, I had personal experience that really helped me see the importance of the separation of money and state before I ever heard of Bitcoin. So then when I did hear of Bitcoin, that it was this money that, that government couldn't censor, that couldn't control, that the individual could control it, then like it immediately clicked for me as, yes, this is, this is something, this is something that, that, that I want to participate in, something that I want to succeed, something that I think could create a world more aligned with how I would like to see it. So I got I got in pretty fast and pretty deep in 2013. And then I kind of drifted, you know, still a fan of Bitcoin, right? Still like a huge advocate of it, but um, not super involved with it until, until more recently, just like two years ago with El Salvador. Okay, so uh, what uh, got you interested in uh, El Salvador then? Yeah, so I've I've been interested in Latin America. I, I find Latin America to be a really fascinating part of the world, in large part because I admire the social movements here. I admire that that people stand up for themselves here in a way that you know I'm from the U.S. and in a way that I don't necessarily see in the US. So, so I've been attracted to Latin America. I've, I've lived mostly in Ecuador, but a couple of other countries in Latin America in my adult life. And, and you know, Bitcoin is also another thing that, that Latin America and Bitcoin are both are both things that, that I'm very attracted to. So when I heard that, you know, the announcement at the Miami conference in 2021, I was in shock. You know, like I thought that a country might adopt Bitcoin one day, but I didn't think it was going to happen then. So it was, it was a surprise to me, but it was a very pleasant surprise. You know, again, I, this was on the, on the back of the, of the pandemic. Uh, so I was in New York for that. It was as clear as ever to me that the world was broken, that the world was on a path that was unsustainable. And, and in these long walks that I took in an abandoned world, right? Like a world gone mad. I thought a lot about how we could get on the right path and for me, the answer was Bitcoin. Like Bitcoin was was going to play an important role in getting us on on the right path. So that was a pre-existing thought. And then when I heard about El Salvador, there were there were some some thoughts in my head already about how education, specifically in the global south, would be really important. But a specific type of education, a type of education that was independent, impartial, and you know, community based. And it just seemed like El Salvador could be a good fit to one, try that out. And two, if it failed, which I thought that it might, you know, before, before I go in there, like, eh, that might not work out, but it's surely going to be a place where there's a lot of people throwing a lot of things at the wall and seeing what sticks. And, and, you know, I, so I, I moved to El Salvador before the law went into effect soon, soon after the announcement, because it just seemed, it just seemed for me, like a lot of different things had lined up. And I, I wanted to, like, I, I believe that, you know, there's a quote that I like that the, the best way to predict the future is to create it. And I think, I think El Salvador gives us that opportunity, right? El Salvador is, is a place where we could experiment and, and see what works. And, and, and I, I was really drawn to that. Yeah, no, I, can, I can understand the appeal myself, if I may say so. 
I think there's definitely something interesting going on there. And um, the fact that uh, they're um, getting into Bitcoin, I think, is just one, you know, it's, it's what draws us as Bitcoiners there. But I think the country itself overall is going through something pretty astonishing. And, and you notice this over the last couple of years in terms of the change that has been going on there. So you decided to move to El Salvador. How does uh, Mi Primer Bitcoin, my first Bitcoin, go about? Yeah. So I, I, you know, I had worked through the idea a little bit in my head before going down. I had, I had lived in Ecuador earlier in 2021, and I tried something similar, which didn't work out. You know, but to give to give someone a little bit of Bitcoin to go into their community and teach others about it, and as part of the class, like give a little bit away so people could actually use it. And so I had the idea in my head. I had like a mission statement worked out, website, just like very, very rough outline. But when I went to El Salvador, the first place that I went to was El Zante, so Bitcoin Beach. You know, that's that's a really important place in, in the history of Bitcoin in El Salvador. That was an example that I think gave confidence to people that, okay, let's maybe we could do this on a bigger scale. It worked in this in this one place, in this one town. So I went there to get a, to try to get a sense of thing. And then I went to San Salvador, which is where I've been ever since. I only spent a week in El Zante. And every Salvadorian I met, I asked them about Bitcoin and I asked them like what they thought about it. And, and if, if they showed any interest, if they would be, if they would be interested in participating in educating others about Bitcoin, like educating their peers about, uh, so it was literally just every single person that I spoke to, I just brought up Bitcoin. And what was interesting was in San Salvador, this is a different case in El Zante, but in San Salvador, then this is before the law went into effect. People had heard of Bitcoin because the announcement had been made already, but the Bitcoin adoption was very nearly zero in San Salvador at the time. Like people didn't know very much about it. There was curiosity for sure. But so the, the first, the first days, weeks, months of the project was a, was a very eclectic group of Salvadorians, you know, it was. It was somebody who is my Uber driver, somebody who I met through an Airbnb host, somebody who like, it was a very diverse group of people. The common denominator was just that they were interested in Bitcoin and enthusiastic about educating others about that. But they came from a, a, a pretty wide variety, uh, like a very diverse background. Yeah. And so uh, when, when did you begin with uh, making uh, Mi Premier Bitcoin? So our first, our first class in El Salvador was in September 2021, which is the same, the same the, that the Bitcoin law went into effect. And, you know, in those early days, <laughs> those, so the very first class that we had, it was in, we didn't have a space, we didn't have any resources. So the, the teacher of that class, his name is Victor, his sister is a yoga instructor and she was able to lend us the space that she used as a yoga studio between sessions. There was like a gap there between classes there. So we used that space. We brought like fold up chairs in and one person came. <laughs> so, you know, we, we grew, we grew a lot from there, but, uh, you know, in the beginning we were, we were just getting our foot in trying to figure out the best way the best way to teach it, but also the best way to recruit students, um, the best way to do everything, right? Like, again, we we came, the people in the early days came from a diverse background. And I myself, I like I've worked as a teacher before, but but it was a totally new venture, right? So there is there is there was and continues to be a very steep learning curve. But yeah, humble beginnings. Yeah. And so then how did this thing uh, pick up? Yeah, so we then in 2021, that was still the bull market. And, you know, as much as I wish th this wasn't true, there's a strong correlation between people's interest in Bitcoin and the trend of, of Bitcoin's price. There was a lot of interest. There was a lot of, there wasn't a ton of knowledge. The, the knowledge base among Salvadorians here in San Salvador was, was, was not very high, but the interest was very high. So we were able to get more students and the, the very original model that we had was the teachers were paid. So we, we gave, we gave a bonus and sat to the students so they could actually use Bitcoin in the class, but the teacher salary, this is all paid in Bitcoin. The teacher salary 
was dependent on them finding a place to teach and students to to teach as well. So they were kind of like an all in one. So people started out just teaching their neighbors, their coworkers, their friends, um, and that picked up fairly quickly. So you know now the numbers seem really small, but at the time they seemed really big. So we had five students that first month in September, October. We had eighty students by. November, then we had like 250 students, which at the time seemed seemed like a lot, you know, for for a project that had just gotten started. Then in 2022, you know, we continued to expand. We topped out in 2022 at 1,400 students in a single month. And we also added the, so in the beginning, it was just the intro class, right? So, so the whole project is focused on getting Salvadorians off of zero. We're not trying to teach Bitcoiners more advanced Bitcoin knowledge. We're trying to teach people who know little or nothing about Bitcoin and encourage them to take their first steps. So the the very first class that we had, the only thing that we had in 2021 was an intro class, just a very basic um, introduction to Bitcoin. And in 2022, we started to add some more diverse educational offerings. Uh, importantly, we added the the Bitcoin diploma which is a 10 week program, which, which, you know, it, it's, it's financial literacy. The first three, the first four weeks are financial literacy, right? It's just about what is money? Why is money? How did, what is the history of it? How did we get here? And, and then we get into Bitcoin once, once that foundation is established. And that has been very successful. The Bitcoin diploma has, has been very successful. We piloted it in, in one school. And there was just a lot of demand. Again, there was a lot of curiosity. There is a lot of curiosity here. So there was a, a desire for it. We, we now teach the Bitcoin diploma in a variety of different places and schools around the country, uh, out of mayor's offices, out of community centers, out of our own house. Um, but all of it is by request, right? Like we've actually never approached a school. We've never approached an institution and asked like, hey, can we come here and teach about Bitcoin? And they've actually approached us. So yeah, there's there's that demand there. So the Bitcoin diploma was was really important for our for our growth. You know, things like adopting Bitcoin, which is an annual conference here, that has been really important as well because, you know, as as Bitcoiners come here, then we get to meet them. There's a certain momentum to things, both with Bitcoiners that know about the program and then could support it, uh, maybe by donating or 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 contributing in, in a variety of different ways. Or the more students we have, the more they tell their friends like, hey, if you want to learn about Bitcoin, here's here's a resource for you. So it's it's kind of gotten its own momentum now, uh, but but it's aided by the fact that we've increased the offerings. We also have some occasionally we do have more advanced classes, uh, you know, about hardware wallets or, or privacy, security, just some more advanced topics. That's that's not the focus. That's that's kind of an add on. And sometimes internal to make sure that that our own teachers and the own, and the people that work for us uh, to to try to better educate them, and then if it's successful, then maybe we offer it to the public afterwards. So yeah, just increasing what we offer has been really helpful. It's been really helpful to grow, just forming these partnerships with with different people, like the Bitcoin Office with Max and Stacy has been really really helpful in, in, in making introductions to work with a variety of different people. And then, you know, I, I, I really believe that the, the success of me premier Bitcoin and the growth of me premier Bitcoin, it's multifaceted and, and, you know, I want to shout out all these great teachers and great people that work on the project, but I also think that it's an idea whose time has come, right? It's like right time, right place. Yeah. What do you cover? So basically, uh, for, well, first of all, what are the uh, age um, groups that you cover? How how old do you have to be to to get into this? So when we when we teach in in public schools, then it's a it's a narrow age range, right? It's like a group of students who are studying together, usually in their last year or two uh, before they would graduate. What what I would call high school, fifteen to nineteen, you know, depending on the specific group, maybe. 16 to 17 is 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 the average age you could say there uh, but when we teach it outside of there then it's it's uh, open enrollment and when we have open enrollment then 
there's a wide range. So we've we've had a student go through the diploma as old as I think 81 years old. And this this was actually somebody, this is a cool story. He lived in a very rural community and it took him two hours on buses each way to get to the class. And he was like always early, always stayed late. So that's one end of the spectrum. And the other end, I think we've had students as young as, as 11 or 12. So it's, it's, it's quite diverse there. Yeah. And so you think like 11 year olds, 12 year olds, they're um, old enough to understand this uh, material. I think they are at the edge, right? So I think there are, might be some individuals who are 11 and 12 who could understand it. But as you get to 12, 13, then, then I think most 12 and 13 year olds could like an 11 year old, I think maybe a special 11 year old can might be a little bit too advanced. If you go, if you go younger than that, it's actually quite, you know, even though I'm talking about relatively young people, 11, 12, 13, 14, it's quite advanced, right? It is very suitable for adults as well. And, and in fact, adults sometimes find it more difficult because there's, there's something of an unlearning there, right? Like, Whereas younger minds tend to be a bit more elastic with, with concepts that, that, that Bitcoin brings up. There's actually, I see a lot of pros with that, with that younger demographic. Interesting. So what, are the, uh, w- what is the material that you guys teach? Can you give us like an overview of uh, what the content is? I have, a, I have a Bitcoin diploma with me right here. So I'll just open it up to the table of contents. So yeah, the, again, like I said, the first, the first four classes are just, or actually, I'm sorry, the first three classes are just a background, right? So it's, so it's what is the monetary system? What is the history and the evolution of money? What are the effects of, of fiat money and centralization of, of money? So that's, that's just to, to create the foundation. And all of this, we try as much as possible to, to just present the information, right? As independent and impartial, and then the students the students decide, right? But it's important that we think it's important that they have that foundation to begin with. And then the rest of the courses, once we get into Bitcoin, once we get class four, which is the intro to Bitcoin, then class five is is like how to move your Bitcoin and how to how to custody your Bitcoin. And like each each class becomes a bit thematic then after that. You know, in in there's a class that's just about miners and what Bitcoin mining is. And in fact, something that we want to do for that, we we teach this in the city of Berlin here in El Salvador, which there's some Bitcoin mining nearby. So we're trying to incorporate that into the class at that specific location so they could actually go and see the miners um, in a lot of the classes. So when we talk about how to move Bitcoin, how to buy Bitcoin, how to custody Bitcoin, then we use, you know, we use different Bitcoin wallets so they could actually use it. Uh, there's a Salvadorian company here, K1, which makes a Bitcoin ATM, which is which is just you could only buy Bitcoin with change. It's it's a very small uh, machine. It's 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 pretty simple, but it's very effective as an educational tool. I mean, it's effective to buy to buy some Sats too, but uh, but we try to we try to make the education as interactive as possible whenever we can. And then we talk about like the the scarcity of Bitcoin, the price of Bitcoin, and then we end it all with Bitcoin today and looking forward. And this is a little bit specific. So this talks about more recent things, right? So like Taro and Segwit and Taproot and all those things, but also specific to El Salvador, because this is, this is contextual, right? Like everybody, everybody comes at Bitcoin from a different angle and, and here in El Salvador, it's a little bit different than it would be in other places because it is legal tender. So we try to emphasize to students how they could integrate Bitcoin into their life and into planning for their future. And one of the things that that we have on our roadmap is to to try to create visible pathways to economic alternatives. You know, just having jobs boards like there's there's somebody that we work with that is trying to. Uh, so he works in the call center industry, which is quite quite significant here in, in El Salvador. It's it, same time zone as the U.S. and Canada, fairly significant English-speaking population here, people that are, are capable to, to, to work for call centers based in North America for North American companies. So that's an existing industry here. And what, what one of the things that we're looking at, just to give an example, is 
to try to get Bitcoin companies to base their call centers in in San Salvador and El Salvador and to source the the employees as graduates from from the Bitcoin diploma. So students are able to see like, okay, this actually, this means something, right? Like this isn't just, I'm just learning about this thing and then I'm going to forget about it. Like this is actually something that could positively impact yeah. my future. And so the material, I mean, a lot of people complain about how hard it is to get into Bitcoin, how hard self-custody is, how complicated owning your private keys is. But you're telling me here that, you know, high school kids in El Salvador can figure this out? Yes. Yes. A lot of Twitter thought leaders are uh, going to be embarrassed to find out about this. What did you say? Yeah, Bitcoin is what what I have found based on personal experience with thousands of students is people almost always overestimate how difficult it is to start using Bitcoin. So that's that's one of the things that that we try to do. So when we have meetups, uh, so we have a monthly meetup in San Salvador and we try to make it a desirable environment for Salvadorians to come to who are not yet Bitcoiners, right? I mean, plenty of Bitcoiners come, plenty of Bitcoiners come but, but, but we're always encouraged to, to try to get Salvadorians who are new to the space and, and we'll give them a little bit of Bitcoin and we'll negotiate a discount if you pay with Bitcoin at that establishment. So, you know, they, they, they buy a, a drink or an appetizer, whatever, whatever they're getting and they pay with Bitcoin and, and, and they've never used it before. Right. And it so often is an aha moment for them because like they had the idea in their head that Bitcoin was for other people. Bitcoin was for people who are very tech savvy. Bitcoin was for people who Bitcoin wasn't for them. It was for, for somebody who was better versed in the topic, somebody that understood the philosophy, that understood the technology better than, than they were. And that's important, right? I'm not saying that, that you could learn everything in a day and in an interaction, but, but what we're trying to do is to get people started on that journey. And it is easier than people think I, when I say that, I don't just mean our students and people that we interact with here in El Salvador. I mean, Bitcoiners too. Like when I go to, I, I was in the, the conference in Miami in, what was that in May? And I used Bitcoin less there at a Bitcoin conference than I do in just an average day here in El Salvador. And, and there were, there were, you know, we had, we had donations, we were accepting Donations, we were selling t-shirts and many people, like maybe 60% of the people didn't pay with Bitcoin. They, they paid with cash instead. And then there were a few people who, you know, are Bitcoiners, right? They're going to this Bitcoin conference that had only made one or two transactions with Bitcoin before, right? And like we almost had to, it was almost like they were a student that were new to it, right? So I, I, I think using Bitcoin is easier than than a lot of people think both within and without the space. Yeah, I mean, I think um, uh, I like the metaphor of driving a car. Sure, if you've uh, lived all your life on an island with horse-drawn carriages, uh, donkeys for transportation, obviously a car is intimidating, seems very scary. But billions of people around the world know how to drive cars. I mean, at the end of the day, it's, uh, it's a process. You do it. And, uh, you know, you start off with the guidance, somebody's over your head, they teach you how to do it. You do it in a, uh, you know, some, most people start sometimes in, uh, empty roads or parking lots where you're practicing with in a setting where if things go wrong, nothing bad's going to happen. So if you lose control of the car in an empty parking lot, you know, you drive for a few, um, meters or a few dozen meters in one direction and nothing and bad happens to you. And then over time, you practice more and more, you get better at it. And then once you've established command of it, then you take the car and you go on the road. And I think that's, I think a very good model for thinking about how to do Bitcoin. Yeah, of course you can get all of your coins lost. You can mess it up. It's just like you could drive your car off a cliff or you could drive into another car or you can drive into a tree and you can't hurt yourself, but if you know what you're doing, you know, you go along and it offers you enormous amounts of benefits. 
So you minimize the risks and you appreciate the benefits over time. And then you reach a point of command. You know, if you look at your average taxi driver or not even your average, uh, say, daily driver, per people who drive every day to work, driving becomes second nature. They can drive while talking to somebody else. They can drive while thinking about something else. They can carry out a conversation and be fully focused on the topic of the conversation while also managing to navigate the road perfectly safely. So a lot of taxi drivers all over the world will have a will have a microphone to, in their ears and they'll be on the phone for hours with other people while they're driving and it becomes second nature. After a while, once you know what you're doing and when you figure out what you're doing, you become pretty good at it. And there's no reason why Bitcoin custody and using Bitcoin should be any different. Yeah, it's a technical thing, but there's a way of doing it. And there are different ways of doing it. And this is, I think, the key thing. It's on, on a sense, uh, in, one, in some sense, it's kind of um, intimidating that there are different ways of doing it. You could have a hardware wallet, you could have a phone wallet, you could have a wallet on your laptop, you could have a paper wallet if you want, or you, know, you could have multi-sig, and there are many different options. And so that can be confusing and intimidating, but in reality, it shouldn't be because all of these options offer you different trade-offs that optimize for your own situation, your own skills, your own security, how are you able to keep things uh, safe, what kind of devices you have access to. So yeah, I'm, I'm not too astonished to say that. I, I think that's a great analogy with, with the car thing. And it's, it's a process, right? It's really, really hard to be a professional driver that you know, you're an F1 or whatever. It's not that hard to go to an empty parking lot and, and start. Right. So it's a process and we all start in empty parking lots it, and that is not hard. And that's, that's something that we have to, we have to remind people that you don't have to start as an F1 driver, right? You just start in an empty parking lot. Exactly. Yeah. So when it comes to the material that you teach, what kind of feedback have you gotten from the students about your material and about uh, the Bitcoin process? I'm curious. This kind of um, mass production of uh, Bitcoiners. So you've, so far you said you've had something like 20,000 students who have covered this material, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I think this is enormously valuable in terms of the feedback that they give. What are the things that they found to be most useful to understand about Bitcoin? What are the things that they found the most difficult, most useless? Yeah. And this, this varies, you know, student to student a little bit, but something that, that that I've been really impressed with is so the very first page of the diploma asks why Bitcoin and the very last page asks why Bitcoin. The answers that the students give is really insightful because in the beginning, it's mostly blank. It's like, I don't, I don't know why Bitcoin, but by the end, you know, people write like mini essays about it, especially the, the students that like the, the really good students who really get it. And what resonates with me most is the ones that see it as a, as a, as a way to have better control over their future. Like it, it clicks with many people that, so El Salvador is a place that doesn't have its own currency. So it's, it's, it's dollarized here. They dollarized in 2001, I believe. I think there are concepts that we know intuitively, but then when it's explained to us then we understand it in a new way. And I think like, a concept that people understand intuitively is that they don't control their money. And when you don't control your money, you don't control your life. And that's especially true in a place that like their own government doesn't. I mean, even if even in a place like the US, you don't control your money. But in a place like El Salvador, it's even more exaggerated because their own government isn't even the one that that prints the money and makes those monetary policies and decisions. You know, there's inflation with the dollar and which is like a current topic, right? Things are getting more expensive. And people know that it's not because of something that they did, right? It's because of policies that were decided somewhere else without their input. And, and that, that comes across with, with many students or, or the ones that like really stand out to me. They could really conceptualize that a lot better after learning about Bitcoin. And what we do, again, we, we try to make the material as interactive as possible. That's that's something that we're forever moving in that direction. So just an example, an activity that we do to 
to explain mine in, or, or to explain this is a, maybe an, an easier one, uh, to, to explain the double coincidence of wants, right? So this is like pre-Bitcoin. Then like everybody has slips of paper with different items and they know they have another item that they want to get, but how are you going to get it? And, you know, they have to like talk to all these different people and maybe they don't get it because they've traded it to someone else by that time and they want to hold on to it. And it's just a very inefficient method of, of exchange and, you know, what you have for what you want. So like people don't even understand money. They intuitively understand why having a common denominator is important, but they after they do activities like that, then they understand it in, in, in a new way. And again, what, what we continually find is people learn these concepts best when they could practice them themselves. And, you know, everybody's, everybody learns differently, right? Some people learn through lectures, some people learn through reading, but we have found for Bitcoin specifically, the interactive, interactive education works really well because that's a mental block that people have with Bitcoin because it is not tangible. So to make it as to make it physical to when when you explain it, uh, we have found has been really really useful. Yeah. So what are your thoughts about uh, Bitcoin adoption in El Salvador in general in terms of uh, the way that it is taken off? So uh, one of the criticisms that you usually hear is that Bitcoin is a bottom up thing, but this is being imposed top down in El Salvador, and that's against the ethos of Bitcoin. Uh, generally, anytime somebody says the ethos of Bitcoin, I uh, I reach for my wallet and I think they're about to try and rip me off, or at least they're trying to concern troll about something uh, ridiculous because they're just project projecting things on Bitcoin. Bitcoin is software, and and it's uh, you know it, it's a journalist thing to try and always impose a narrative on things because then you impose a narrative and then you get to complain that um, people are not abiding by the narratives and that you are so. I'm sorry for um, taking half of the answers away from you, but yeah. No, I think I think we 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 see eye eye on that. So you know, you talked about that people are imposing things on Bitcoin. And I totally agree. Bitcoin doesn't care. Bitcoin doesn't care whether the president of a country encouraged his his uh, citizens to use it or whether the citizens in, encouraged its president to use it. Right? Like Bitcoin doesn't care if it's top down, bottom up. I think there's a variety of different ways that that Bitcoin adoption will come. And I support all of them. I think there's going to be a mix of different things. There, There is, you know, the, the again, going back to Bitcoin Beach, I think that was a project that encouraged the government in El Salvador to take that step, right? And Bitcoin Beach is this bottom-up thing. I mean, Bitcoin is a bottom-up thing, right? So it's like they both exist at the same place and the same time. And... There's a lot of advantages from from just where I sit. I think it's important that education is independent and impartial. And we, this is not a government program, right? We are not a government organization. We have no funding from the government, no direction from the government. But we work with them because we have shared objectives for, for some things. And that makes it so much easier for us. Like it would be so much harder if this was a hostile environment. So... Yeah, our approach is bottom up, but like there's such a benefit at the same time to 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 have a friendly government. So, yeah, going back to one of the things that attracts me to Bitcoin is that it doesn't care, right? Bitcoin doesn't care where you were born. It doesn't care who you voted for. It doesn't care how much or how little Bitcoin you have, right? And 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 I think we should take a cue from Bitcoin and not not care. Yeah, I, I I agree, and I think it's it. This is very rich because it's usually coming from the kind of people that are <laughs> essentially um, fiat coin enthusiasts, and you know the, the the alternative the alternative to Bitcoin is the dollar. The only uh, or Bitcoin is the only alternative to the dollar, and so it's pretty rich coming from people who are essentially telling you that no, you should join the global monetary system that has one central bank controlled by a few criminals in the U.S. government and then have that monetary system be used everywhere in the world and that anybody who's trying to get out of that is wrong because it's, you know, it's not purely bottoms up enough. 
And of course, um, the, I think the best way of thinking about it is that El Salvador government itself is a bottom-up uh, approach to try and get out of the uh, World Bank, IMF, U.S. Federal Reserve, a global slavery system. And that's really what is uh, what it is about. I think ultimately the most important thing for me about the adoption of Bitcoin, and this is something that's not very popular for uh, Bitcoiners. Um, most Bitcoiners don't like me to say this, but for me, the most important thing in El Salvador is the fact that the government is stacking sats rather than U.S. Treasury bonds. This is really what it comes down to. If the government is able to get uh, out of holding U.S. Treasuries by holding more and more Bitcoin, and if the government is able to get out of debt because they can hold an asset that appreciates rather than continue to hold bonds that depreciate over time and continuously need to continue to borrow, that's going to be the real issue. That's going to be the real thing. If the, the best thing that any government could do for its people is break out of the fiat slavery system, break out of the dollar's hegemony, break out of the system wherein they need to keep holding dollars, and they need to keep dealing with the Federal Reserve, they need to keep um, borrowing from the IMF, borrowing from the global dollar capital markets, because that's a treadmill. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a system for slavery. So you're constantly holding dollars and dollar denominated assets that are depreciating with time because the US government can print more of them. And so you're running on a treadmill effectively. You can't get ahead in that kind of system. You're always, and it's not even a treadmill, it's going backwards because you know every year your assets are depreciating. And so therefore your country is effectively being enslaved. So you need to be working hard in order to be buying more assets and uh, paying off, the, getting into debt. That's your only way of trying to beat this is to get into debt. You can't finance your expenditures from your savings, from your cash balance, because your cash balance is constantly depreciating. So you need to constantly be borrowing. And that's how they get you, basically. So for me, even if nobody in El Salvador was using Bitcoin at all, and the government was just stacking sats with the long-term view of um, a holding more of this so that they don't have to continuously go to the capital markets to borrow in dollars and witness their dollar denominated assets depreciate. That I think is grassroots enough for me. And uh, if, if you don't like that because you know it's coming from the president and it's not being driven, you know, we didn't first have every single person in El Salvador holding their own private keys um, and running their own node and uh, doing all of the rituals and the processes of Bitcoin individually before the government adopts it, then I'm going to go ahead and guess that you're just interested in um, propagating the dollars uh, cartel monopoly. And I'm going to go ahead and also make a guess that you are getting paid by an organization that gets printed dollars from the US government and the Federal Reserve, which, you know, is true for pretty much all academics um, yeah. and most US-based um, institutions. I, I think one of the great things about Bitcoin, again, and this is like similar to the, to the previous point, is that different people will come at it from different angles, right? Like what attracts me to Bitcoin is different from what attracts the next person to Bitcoin. Like the advantage that I see from, from integrating Bitcoin into my life is different from the advantage that the government of El Salvador sees with integrating it. But that doesn't mean that only one should be happening, right? Um, that it should only be happening based on like what makes sense from my specific perspective. Like I, I, I like the phrase, Bitcoin is your enemy's money, right? Like it's, it's not, people will use it in ways that you wouldn't. And that's okay. Right. You don't have to. You don't, you don't have to agree with 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 uh, who uses Bitcoin. Anybody could, you know, whether it's a government, an individual, I. I'm happy to to, you know, I'm obviously happy to see what El Salvador is doing with Bitcoin. That's why I'm here. I'm a big I think El, Sal El Salvador is has so much potential to create positive precedents and examples that that others can follow, right? Like they're they're creating a template here. And they're creating a template on a variety of different levels. They're creating a template on a at a government level, but 
Uh, I hope that we are creating a template at a, at a grassroots education level. There's other projects that are creating their own templates because this is an environment that is friendly to experimenting with different ways to, to achieve Bitcoin adoption. And, and that is such a valuable thing that we have an environment that allows for that to happen. I'm really excited about the future of Bitcoin and the future of El Salvador. I think we probably share that view, right? Um, with, with your recent trip here, this is a really hopeful place. And it's not just Bitcoin, right? It's hopeful for, for a variety of other things. But I think Bitcoin fits really well into that. Like, I think Bitcoin for me represents the future and, and, and more control over our future. And the more we have control over our future, the more we're encouraged to do something positive with that control, right? And that is, that's true with Bitcoin, but it's also true here in El Salvador, specifically with like, with safety issues that, you know, people feel like they have more control in their life now for a variety of different things. It's not just Bitcoin. I think Bitcoin just, just matches really well with that, but it's such a hopeful place here, a place that strives towards the future rather than cowers from it. And that makes everything. Right. That is that changes everything. Yeah, I really I really think this is this is very true. I think and it's something that I tweeted when I first came back from El Salvador, which is you go anywhere in the world and everybody's basically complaining about how everything's getting more expensive and how the future is looking darker and less promising. And, uh, you know, the housing is so much more expensive. I'm never going to be able to afford a house or this problem or that problem. Everybody's always got bad things going on when they're looking at their future pretty much everywhere in the world. And I think ultimately it's inflation that's at the heart of that. Obviously, uh, you know, if you listen to mainstream media, <laughs> they'll tell you it's because of carbon dioxide ruining the weather or it's because of um, diseases or viruses or whatever. That's it's ruining everything. And of course, that's ridiculous. Uh, carbon dioxide is not ruining the weather and people aren't worried about the world being imperceptibly warmer by a tiny little bit in the next few years. Uh, what's ruining people's lives and what's making them very, very um, worried is almost always inflation. And in El Salvador, I mean, we're not at a point where people in El Salvador are able to, you know, think of themselves as having escaped inflation by no stretch of the imagination. We're still very early. The vast majority of people in El Salvador don't have any serious amount of uh, Bitcoin in their savings. And the government, uh, you know, they're probably about even on their uh, Bitcoin position. So Bitcoin hasn't even been very profitable for them. So it's not fair to say that it is Bitcoin that has changed the economic fortunes of the country. It's not Bitcoin that is fixing El Salvador, but it is a Bitcoiner who is fixing El Salvador. I think that's the really key point. It is the, the president is a Bitcoiner at the end of the day, and he does understand this. And he does have a vision of the future. And I think this is something that I can always keep insisting upon in my work, which is that once you have a harder money, once you're able to escape inflation, then you're able to see further ahead. The future becomes less uncertain for you. And then you're able to plan more and more for the future. And for me, this is what drove, this is part of what drove him, or this is part of the kind of mentality that would drive him toward wanting to, uh, you know, fight the gangs do something that might be in the short term quite expensive, you know, politically risky because, you know, you the, the war didn't have to work out as well as it did. Uh, it could have been expensive politically. It could have been, it could have been risky and dangerous militarily. You know, the, the, the military and the police might have suffered serious losses from fighting with the gangs. And it could have been really expensive, of course, with the uh, foreign gangs that support the local gangs, which is essentially the international NGO uh, criminal uh, cartel and the fiat banking system, which seems to be extremely fond of um, criminal gangs everywhere in the world. And I think you see this not just in El Salvador and in Latin America in general, you also see it in the US. There clearly does seem to be a very serious meeting of the minds, let's say, between uh, the uh, your local uh, street thugs and the international uh, uh, fiat system and the beneficiaries of the fiat system. 
So you look at a place like the US, I mean, you can get arrested for defending yourself from somebody who has um, tried to attack you. But then it's much harder to get arrested if you just initiate attacks. And I think the last couple of weeks, we've seen several pretty high profile examples of this. And, you know, if you've been to any um, major US city recently, which I don't recommend for anybody, um, you'll see just how absolutely amazingly unsafe the streets are, how many clearly criminal people are out in the streets and doing bad things and getting away with them. And I think it's, um, it's, it's pretty telling, you know, we see all of this, what, what, what are called the George Soros DAs who are just uh, getting into power and that district attorney position and uh, not prosecuting people who commit crimes. It, 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 it's quite startling that, you know, you see these uh, human rights organizations, they're not speaking out about, um, you know, why is it that we're, why is it that it's okay for criminals to go around terrorizing people in San Francisco and New York and LA? Why don't those, you know, the rights of the people, of the, of the rights of law abiding um, people in major American cities, somehow not an issue, just like the rights of people in El Salvador, but when those criminals do get thrown in jail, that's when they become extremely concerned about, um, you know, what if they, what if the trial wasn't entirely fair? And I think, you know, if you were to think it in terms of numbers, there are almost certainly many, 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 many more unjustly imprisoned uh, people in the U.S. than there are in El Salvador, both in terms of uh, overall numbers. And most likely even in terms of percentages as well, because in the US, the US criminal system is notorious for um, arresting people who defend themselves, uh, prosecuting them when they try and defend themselves, and also, you know, uh, prosecuting people for all kinds of victimless crimes, which uh, are, are pretty common over there. But we don't see that sort of thing happening. Uh, well, we don't see this thing concern the... Um, a human rights NGOs, we don't see this kind of thing go matter. It's only somehow when you're actually successfully fighting crime that they become really concerned about human rights records and about potentially somebody in jail might not receive a fully, a fully um, fair trial. It's, it's, it's pretty startling. And I think it's been for me, I think it's been the, the biggest slap in the face of the uh, credibility of um, a lot of these international human rights organizations and a lot of these, uh, you know, the international community is that um, suddenly they're extreme, they become extremely concerned about um, El Salvador once El Salvador manages to fight crime effectively. I think it's very, very telling and it's, uh, it does not look good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, El Salvador and like, you know, I, I'm not saying that I agree with 100% of, of, of what the government here does. I don't agree with 100% of, of any government, right? But the story of safety here, people feel safe. People are safer. People feel safer. And that's demonstrable, right? That is a good thing. That is a good thing. And that's what people want, right? Like, like th this is not being imposed upon people. This is what people are asking for. Uh, and I think, I think that's an important distinction that is often missed. This isn't being imposed. This, this is something that time and time again, you know, 90% plus of the population is, is very much supportive of all this stuff. And it's really hard to get 90% of any population to agree on anything. So to have to have like approval ratings of different policies so high, I think is something worth worth including, something worth you know just just uh, being conscious of. This isn't something that's being imposed upon an unwilling population. It's quite the opposite. And then you know like I we 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 briefly talked uh, in El Salvador about this. Um, but time preference is such an important thing. And like, you know, Bitcoin teaches us to change our time preference. But I think that, again, I think that's naturally happening here. And, and, and I, 
I'm very optimistic that Bitcoin is going to dovetail very well into that. Um, people are already without Bitcoin. Bitcoin, I think, is generally our best tool to help show people the value of having a low time preference, right? Like it, it encouraged us to, to think into the future. But that's happening all on its own here, right? So, so to combine that with Bitcoin is just, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I, I, am, I am excited to see what comes of, of this grand experiment. Yeah, and I, I think I agree. And I think, you know, um, no, I, I, I consider myself an anarchist. I rather live in a world in which governments don't exist. But um, you know, it's it's not the uh, it's 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 not the dunk that you think it is when you tell me, oh well, you're supporting a government that is going to be holding Bitcoin or the government that is um, initiating a crackdown. Yeah, ideally, I wouldn't want to have a government, and because I believe that in a free in a free world, anything that a government can do, I think uh, private actors can do much better if they did not have a monopoly. However, in the presence of a monopoly. This does not mean that a monopoly cannot do things badly versus do things well. So I'm not going to stay stuck at home for all the rest of my life and never leave because all the roads around me have been built by government. Yes, it was a government that built the road. Yes, ideally, and I, I think that uh, you know, a world in which private property owners build their own roads would be much more efficient. We've had a discussion with Walter Block about roads in uh, one of the podcast episodes before. Um, but that does not mean that, you know, I'm not going to ever use a government road and it doesn't make me a hypocrite if I get on a government road and it doesn't make me a hypocrite if I say that, you know, they messed up this particular road and it doesn't make me a hypocrite if I say, oh, wow, they built an actually good road here that works really well. Um, it's possible for them to do things badly and well. And so, yeah, I think ideally I'd rather not have, uh, governments at all. But they do exist at this point. And in this kind of situation, you know, when they do have a monopoly on violence or when they do have a monopoly on security, on fighting crime, there are ways of doing this well and there are ways of doing this badly. And I think El Salvador shows that even with a monopoly, you can do a lot better of a job than most people think. I mean, for me, what's astonishing is just how much crime has been normalized. For most people, um, they've accepted the idea that uh, living in a big city just means that uh, you're going to have this, uh, what they call, you know, a vibrant city, then it just means that people are going to be, um, you know, assaulting each other all day, every day, there's going to be robberies, and there's going to be theft, and there's going to be the occasional murder. And that's just a price you have to pay for being in a big city. But it isn't. Uh, humanity has had big cities that weren't crime-ridden cesspools. You continue to have them. You go to Dubai today, it's a safe place. You walk around, there is no crime, there are no problems, and there isn't. And, and uh, interestingly enough, also, you, you rarely see, you know, a heavy-handed police presence. Um, people are just free and safe to walk around and do what they want. It's not like the police are harassing you all day in order to make sure that crime isn't a problem. In fact, you are like more likely to be bothered by the police in places where crime is a problem because when the police well when crime is a problem that means the police is being incompetent and one great way for the police to be incompetent is to go after law abiding people because law abiding people are not dangerous so you know go after um teenage boys smoking weed is a lot better than uh, going after um criminals because you know an arrest is an arrest but the teenage boys smoking weed are less likely to um uh, shoot back at you, they're less likely to pull out a gun. So I, I still think, you know, that, that there is a good way of doing this. And I think it's, it's pretty startling how El Salvador has managed to pull this off in a way that makes me, you know, as an anarchist, really, really have to admit that, yeah, it is possible even for a monopoly to do this in a way that is not completely um, destructive. Yeah, and, and I would also self-identify as an anarchist. And it is so... Like if I could go back in time to three years ago and tell myself like in three years, you'll be having meetings with like the minister of education of a country and with 
working with the government in this way and that way, I wouldn't have believed it. Right. But it's like, this is the reality that we have. This is, this is a, an amazing opportunity to get a toehold for, for Bitcoin, to experiment with Bitcoin. And that is more important than any preconceived notions uh, about purity tests, whether, you know, this is, you know, well, a government built a road, so I can't, I can't go on it if that means you support the government. This is a really fascinating time. And I think there are a lot of people here in El Salvador who are attracted to this country who also have like very hostile views towards government generally. And and like I, I think it's really important that people if people can if they see it for themselves, right? Like come to El Salvador and and see what's happening here with your own eyes. Like don't believe what you read, don't believe what you hear on Twitter, don't believe me. You know, don't don't trust verify. And there are so many people that I've met that have done that that you know they they've changed their mind. They they obviously had curiosity about the place for them to come in the first place. But it it is so just within me from Bitcoin, there's a number of I think all the foreigners that work for it, right? So it's a it's an international project. So it's a, it's a mix of Salvadorians and there's also foreigners such as myself. And I think all of the foreigners that work on the project came to visit El Salvador, saw there was something worth fighting for here and never left. And there's there's a certain like magic to that, like a certain beauty to that. And these are again, these are people that probably would have never expected them to to be working on a project that cooperates with with the government on 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 some some issues. But you know, we don't we don't live in theory. We live in reality, right? And this is the reality is that El Salvador is a a very important place in the world right now. Like what happens here? What happens here today will have an effect on what happens in the world tomorrow. And there are so few times in human history where an individual or like a group of of people could have such a big impact, right? Like I think this is such a high leverage moment for anyone who cares about the future. Like it's being built right here, right now. And you know, don't don't complain about it, change it, right? Like you could come here and you could, this is a very malleable space right now. If there's something you don't like, then figure out what you what you think is better and and work towards that right that's 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 how i see it at least yeah i i i think i agree and what what is your impression of what el salvadorans think so are are, are all of these uh, uh opinion polls uh actually uh real or do you think they're fabricated is it real that 90 92% of salvadorans approve of the job that the president is doing so this is this is something that I think I would be quite skeptical of if I wasn't living here because politicians are unpopular generally around the world but specifically in Latin America like politicians are unpopular here which is again going back to to the start of the podcast something that attracts me uh, about Latin America is that people like stand up against their governments here no but it's real like it's nuanced right there's there's Within that number, there's some people who are like ride or die with this government. And then there are other people who are more pragmatic, like, hey, I don't I don't like everything that they're doing. But overall, this is a big change in the right direction. Like, I, I, don't, I don't like everything, but it's a net positive. Right. Not everyone's like, I love everything there. There's there's a probably a majority within that would be able to pick out things that they don't like with this government, but they see it as a net positive. El Salvador has come from a very, not a very hopeful past, right? They had a, they had a, an actual civil war, which ended in 1992. And then the two sides from the civil war became the two dominant political parties who kind of continued the war by other means. You know, they, they just, I mean, it's, it's, 
makes me think of the U.S. a little bit, that there's so much like, you know, one side just hates the other. And that's such a such a bad energy. But but it was it was not a hopeful place. Right. So there's been a really dramatic change in a short amount of time. And and people feel it in their everyday life here, like they're not afraid to go out at night. You know, their 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 perception of themselves has changed. And so, yeah, that's real. And, and, and I say this as someone who has, has a South, as a Salvadoran girlfriend who is in that 8% that doesn't, that doesn't support the government. Like I, I get a fair amount of exposure to it, like through that. And even within that social group of that 8%, it's nuanced, right? It's like, well, yeah, but this is still good. You know, like, I don't like this this thing that's happening and that's an important thing for me. So I'm going to, I'm going to be in this 8%, but there's also, I'll reluctantly admit that, that there's good things happening too. So yeah, short, short answer to the question that approval right in hard as it is to believe is, is real. And what do you think are the major quibbles and disgruntlement that, um, this 8% has, what, what are the biggest problems that they have? That's a good question because the, the biggest problem that internationally people have with the government of El Salvador is, you know, like a due process sort of issue. Like you're arresting people without going through, you know, checking off all the boxes that you should. That's not really a concern that people have here. I think there's a, there's always going to be an opposition, right? So like within that 8%, some people are just in the in the former dominant political parties that have roles in those in those political parties so they have really strong incentives to not support what's happening because they're 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 being displaced which is not a real concern right that's like a really self-serving concern i think there are even though this isn't i don't think this is the 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 majority within that eight percent but there are people that that do have more Western style critiques about a consolidation of power um, that they feel uncomfortable with and, you know, worried that if Bukele is the exception of the role, the next person won't be, uh, you know, the the exception that like power doesn't corrupt, um, that the next person won't be. And there's like an infrastructure set up. And that's like, these are, these are real things, right? And like, I sympathize with that for sure. I don't sympathize with the people that, you know, had cushy jobs in the old system and just don't like the changes because of that. You know, even even within within that group, no one thinks that El Salvador was safer two years ago than it is today, right? Like, and that's a big deal. That's a big deal that uh, that it is safer, that there is that hope. So, so there are valid concerns that people have, but yeah, again, it's like hard to believe, but the number is real. It's it's it really is so widely supported what's happening here yeah well i mean um wait until bitcoin number goes up does its thing i think yeah. we're i mean that there's a limit there's a limit of 100 percent approval rate but there's no limit on how far bitcoin can keep going so if they're this happy with bitcoin still at what is it today 26 or whatever um you know if uh, if bitcoin does what it's been doing for the past 14 years i think they might be a lot happier soon Right. And this is, this is, this gives me hope too. Like I see, I see a lot of things through the vantage point of me from rapid coin, right? Cause that's like, that is my life. That is my obsession. Like everything that I do is work towards making that a success, but it's not just that it's so many other things, right? That this is just my prism, how I view things, but it is so inspiring and hopeful for me to see a Bitcoin education project grow in a bear market and it is so inspiring and helpful for me to see all these other projects and all these other initiatives happening here in El Salvador with with the goal of Bitcoin adoption growing in the in these conditions right like I, I think El Salvador is really bucking the trend and it makes me it makes me optimistic to the point of fear of what's going to happen when things turn, because like what, one of the things that we're working on now, so we're going through like a, I mean, we're kind of always going through a restructuring, right? Cause we're, we're an NGO, but, but we operate 
with a kind of a mentality of a startup, like move fast and break things. Um, so because of that, we're always having to redesign systems as we grow and, 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 and as we have to punch through uh, new barriers and obstacles. But this is a this is a, a bigger than usual one that we're going through now, and 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 it's mostly trying to create an infrastructure and setting ourselves up for the future. Because as much demand as there is today, we're trying to anticipate a future in which the demand just explodes, right? And it's like, how are we going to handle that? How how because you know one of one of one of the downsides of a bull market is it brings out it brings out, you know, shit coiners and profit seeking and like, and it makes people vulnerable to, to scams and to, to negative things. And it's like, okay, how are we going to create a system to try to mitigate that? Like through education, that that's, that's, that's the lens that, that I look at it from. Um, but I know that, that like the government is also trying to create that infrastructure, like other projects are trying to create that infrastructure here. It is going to be wild. And I think wildly positive but you know the fear that i mentioned is is are we ready and the answer is no like we're never ready for stuff like that right we're not ready for the world to change we never are we could try to anticipate it as much as we can we could try to plan for it as much as we can um create that infrastructure as much as we can but but things are going to move very quickly here when when that does turn and, you know, again, I'm, I'm always trying to pitch people to come here. They come here now, see what things are like now and come back in a year or two and, and see the difference. And and because it's, it's going to be something that I think will be unprecedented. Right. Like I can't I, I, I don't know what to compare it to. Yeah, I think this is a good point. I hadn't thought about it, but uh, you, you, I think it's a good point that if this, uh, you know, if. Uh, if the last couple of years were the two years before it, you know, when we had two years of just massive mania and the Bitcoin price going up and people speculating that this is it, this is, you know, remember the super cycle talk and that price is never going to go down. Um, if we'd had that, um, if El Salvador had lucked out and started, you know, two years earlier, so they, you know, they started off at Bitcoin at around say three, four thousand, and then it went up all the way to the sixties and seventies. You can imagine your job would be a lot more difficult in a sense because a there'd be a lot more demand, but there'd also be a lot more confusion, a lot more hype, and a lot more um, shit coins, a lot more um, yield scams, and people coming up and telling you, "Oh no, you know you don't want to just hold your Bitcoin. You want to make your Bitcoin work for you by giving it to me and." Uh, where I could give you a yield risk-free, but just don't ask me for where I get it because in reality, you are the yield as we've discussed before. And so in a sense, you've gotten the, uh, you, you've, you, you got lucky with that sense, but uh, I'm curious, how is it with other shit coins and with other kind of projects or with the uh, scams or with people trying to um, sell Ponzi's based on Bitcoin and stuff like that? Do you have a problem with that? Do you notice it as being a major distraction that you see with your students? That they come in and you like teach them a little bit about Bitcoin, and then um, they tell you, "Well, my cousin told me about uh, this better, faster uh, thing called uh, Ripple or Bitcoin Act or Ethereum or whatever." So we did in the beginning, in in like you know those first months, so this hell end of twenty twenty one, which you know was still a bull market. Then people did come in; they'd be like, "Yeah, yeah, Bitcoin." But I heard about this Luna thing or I heard about like whatever. And there was more of a it, it was a more confusing environment. Right. That has gone away. And I think that has mostly gone away, not like 100 percent, but that has mostly gone away. I think it's twofold. One is that I think El Salvador has made the right move to not put out the welcome mat for for, you know, other other coins and 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 more nefarious projects, but I think actually the bear market has actually done most of the heavy lift in there. That people aren't they're not hearing about it, they're not passing that on. So so yeah, I that that is something that I worry will come back. And it's like it's the sort of it's the opposite of I don't know what the phrase is, but the opposite of silver lining, right? It's like this positive thing, but like there's a negative thing that comes with it. And, and I think it's 
you know, going to be a wholly positive thing to get so much more attention on Bitcoin, so much more curiosity that people want to learn about it and use it. But the negative of that is as people are here, like, oh, my neighbor, whatever, made made money doing X, like I want to make money doing X too, or, or I want to find the next X. People aren't looking for the next Bitcoin right now. When, as soon as there's some stupid meme coin that goes up a thousand percent, then they're going to look for the next, the next one, right? Uh, so, so it's a double-edged sword. It's mostly positive, but I think that is something that, and El Salvador will be a really interesting place because this is the first country that has adopted Bitcoin. So how are they going to handle it? And I think that's, I think that's why education is so important. It's so important to have this foundation. So we've we've taught we've taught over twenty thousand students so far. So by the time by the time it turns, I don't know what the numbers will be. I mean, these are relatively small numbers for for a country, you know, with with millions. But if we could create, I mean, so like how how I conceptualize it in my mind is if we because we work in the whole country, right? Like we, there's fourteen departments. We're active in all fourteen of them. Within all the students that we teach, there's going to be a certain percent that that, you know, they, they kind of just move on, but a certain percent will, will get really deep into it and become advocates of it and they will be ambassadors of it. So if we could just have a number of people like distributed around the country, Salvadorians who are seen as people who are knowledgeable about the space, when things explode, they're going to be really important because they're going to be people that will be able to guide their communities, their workplaces, their families, and and kind of naturally advise people like, oh yeah, no, I've been, I've been, I've looked into it. I've been, I went down the rabbit hole last year or two years ago, three years ago, whatever. And they're, they're going to be ambassadors for it. So it's important for us now to make sure that we create that foundation. And I think the stronger that foundation is, the more likely all that bullshit gets, you know, gets a lid put on it very quickly. So, so that, that's what we're thinking about. And I think other, other great projects are, are thinking about this. I think that the Bitcoin office is thinking about this, how to anticipate that and, and how to look forward and, and plan for it. I'm optimistic, but you know, it is going to be an interesting time. And I mean that in all senses, like when things turn, things are going to get very interesting here. I certainly hope so. I certainly hope so. And I, I should have mentioned this earlier, but all of your material is available open source, right? Yes. Yes. In fact, so all of our material is 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 open source. We have a GitHub um, also just on our webpage. You could download it. We do it ourselves in English and Spanish, but we are we are working with with people from the community who are translating it into a, a variety of different languages. Uh, French, German, Portuguese, Swahili, I don't even know what, what all of them are, but, but, um, but yeah, the, the, the long-term goal is to open source everything. So it's not just the educational materials, but it's our, it's our accounting, it's our decision-making processes, all that. So like for accounting is a good example, it's kind of a mess because we, we only work in Bitcoin. So we like, we pay a teacher a salary and they have they have their salaries fixed to a dollar number. So the number of sats that they get each month is different, which, which makes things a, a little bit more complicated. So we're trying to work through and we're trying to find best practices for everything that we do so we could share that. So it's not just, so right now all the educational materials are open source and, and they're being used around the world. Like they're, they're being used. We work with projects so you know projects like amity age in, in honduras or bitcoin jungle in costa rica or bitcoin lake in guatemala so so we actively work with some projects to to try to help them you know try to give them advice like what's worked for us to to teach this and then there are other people that just do it on their own and like maybe they tag us in a tweet and it's like oh we just did week eight and it's like oh i had no idea that that this group in London was even was doing this. So cool. So I, I we don't know the the whole number uh, of people who are using it. But yeah, it's so 
it's so encouraging to see and and the world is changing so fast and i think this is you know bitcoin is a big part of it but like that to open source is such is a value that we hold in such high regard because it it's proof of work right it's like to build walls around the product that you develop to me indicates a lack of faith in it right that it can't it can't survive on its own you could it could only survive if it's like in this more like proof of stake sort of system so this is a change right i think the world is moving toward a bitcoin standard it's moving towards a standard towards a proof of work standard as well yeah i i agree entirely i think that's definitely um I mean, it's uh, it pisses off a lot of uh, no coiners for us to suggest that uh, switching the operating system of society is going to have any kind of implications because it uh, makes them have to think uncomfortable thoughts about um, about the world in which they live in. It's like telling a fish that you know the water that you've always been in is actually polluted, and that's why that's why you're so messed up. It's the water that you're swimming, in, um, and. and and, you know, they don't want to change their water. They're happy in the sewage <laughs> they're in. People, people are afraid of change, right? It's like people are afraid of change, but they shouldn't be. We should embrace change. And peop, I, I think one of the reasons why people are afraid of change is because the world that we live in avoids pain, right? Like we're always trying to avoid pain in the world that we live in. Like if you lose your password, just reset it. Somebody else will will help you reset it. If you lose your 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 uh, you know your phone, you didn't back it up, uh, then you lost your Bitcoin on it, right? And and that's that's how it should be. You should feel pain. You should have responsibility. And if you don't if you don't administer that responsibility well, you should feel pain because you will learn from that pain. We live in a world in which we are increasingly insulated from that. And that makes us, it, it, it creates this negative feedback loop, which makes us ever more fearful of change. And the world is, the pace of change in the world is accelerating. So if you're afraid of change, then learn how to deal with it, or you're going to be very uncomfortable in the coming years. Yeah. We've got Peter uh, who's asking a question. Um, could you give us more details on how Bitcoin adoption has progressed in El Salvador since you first moved there? Do you have any metrics that can help us understand how much Bitcoin is being used by the general population? Okay. Oh, cool. Yeah, I didn't even see this chat. There are surveys of of like how many people have used Bitcoin in the past ninety days or the past twelve months or ever, and that number is is going up. I think the numbers that I've seen there's a couple of different surveys. But the numbers that I've seen are always between 5% and 20%, which is kind of a big range. The, the reality is probably somewhere in the middle, so we could say maybe 10%. Uh, it depends how you measure it, whether you measure it. It's someone that's, that's used Bitcoin in the past. When you change that time period, then the, the, then the number will change. But again, as I said, that number was, was very close to zero uh, in 2021. So I think there is a critique that people have. Let's say, let's say, just just for a round number, 10%. Oh, so 90% aren't actively using Bitcoin. So it's a failure. And it's like, no, we went from zero to 10, from 0% to 10%, mostly in a bear market, which is to me, incredible growth and a very clear trend. So there are other metrics like from that, that I think uh, maybe the, the best source of them would be, would be Bitcoin companies here. So payment processors, how many people have have downloaded, you know, whatever the specific wallet is and how that has has trended over time. Um, and that's that's all trending. Again, all of these are small in 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 that it's a minority, right? It's not like 60% of the country is is using this. And but for me, what I look at and what I think is more important is the trend. And the trend is 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 again very clear that that every day, every week, every month, more people are exposed to this, uh, more businesses are using it. So that that's, I think that's the metric that matters. Yeah, no, I, I think that's, uh, that's ultimately what it is. There's, um, I think a lot of uh, people in fiat just expect this to be a, um, 
a quick thing. And I, and I always tell people, this isn't uh, an app that people are downloading. It's not WhatsApp. Uh, it's not Facebook. It's not something that can take off very quickly because it's, uh, you know, Bitcoin may be software, but the function that it fulfills is money and it takes the place of other monies in your cash balance. And moving away from one money to another is not a simple task. It's a very complicated thing because your cash balance being in one currency means that all of your assets and all of your all of the money that you make, all of the money that you spend, all of the you know, suppliers that you buy from, all of the people that you pay, they're used to taking, they're, they're all used to using a particular currency with you. And you can't just wake up one day and tell them, hey, uh, I'm not paying you in dollars anymore, I'm not paying you in Bitcoin. And so there's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem uh, in there, but it's not really a chicken and egg problem. It just takes time. You know, so pe people think of it as chicken and egg, like, yeah, no, no, you have to switch completely and then they'll switch. Um, but that's not how it works. What happens is that gradually you grow your Bitcoin cash balance and gradually they grow their Bitcoin cash balance. And over time, if Bitcoin continues to work and it continues to appreciate while fiat money continues to depreciate, then naturally the cash balances in Bitcoin are going to grow a lot more. And that's going to make it a lot better. Right. And that's something something that, that I've noticed that happens naturally is like stores that accept Bitcoin. Um, and maybe to, to, to go back to Peter's question, Bitcoin is easy to use here. Uh, like I mostly use Bitcoin because I like I'm going to get coffee and there's two coffee shops and one has a has like a good payment processor that uses Bitcoin, I'm going to go there rather than the one next to it. Um, but, you know, that's not something that the average Salvadorian does. The average Salvadorian is, you know, again, it's minority that uses it, but it's 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 trending in the right direction. Uh, but but a thing that I've that I've seen naturally occur is people that have both that have dollars in Bitcoin, like it's a business that accepts Bitcoin. So they have a balance there. They spend their dollars and they save their Bitcoin. And that is that is not something that they were told to do. It's something that just naturally has happened in many cases. Uh, and that's that's uh, it's encouraging for me. I think the best teacher we have is Bitcoin itself. Like just the incentive system that it has, like it incentivizes us to save, right? Like, so with this, with this person that has dollars in Bitcoin, Bitcoin is the one to save and dollars are the ones to spend because dollars are worth less in the future. Uh, Bitcoin is worth more in the future. So, so yeah, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's cool to see it in the real world. And again, this is why I know I keep like hammering on how great El Salvador is, but, uh, but it's not theory. It's, it's, it's happening, right? It's not happening with everyone everywhere all the time, but if you look for it, you could see it happening in the real world Yeah, right here, right now. Yeah, and that's, that's a good way of putting it. Um, all right, tell us more about where people can find you, how they can help, what they can do, how they can take your resources and what they can do with them, how they can use them, um, what other uh, general information you can uh, give. Yeah, so a few things. You know, I'll start with the most obvious. So it's just to donate. So we, we, we give away Bitcoin. Um, we pay our teachers in Bitcoin. Like, you know, we break down our expenses, what we use. We have a... We have a you could donate on our website. We also have a campaign on Geyser where you could find us to donate there. And that's super helpful. Uh, but then there's so many other ways to help. So you could translate the, the Bitcoin diploma into your local language. Uh, you could teach it in your local community. You could reach out to us if, if you do want to do these things. And if you have questions, then we'll do our best to to guide you along in that process to to, to try to make it more successful. We're actually build in a coalition of of Bitcoin educators around the world who are interested in this particular brand of Bitcoin education, which is independent, impartial, community-led Bitcoin education. So we work together to share best practices. Some of the projects that I mentioned earlier, we're, we're in constant communication with them to see how we could help each other and learn from each other's mistakes and successes and failures and, and advancements and all of that. And you could be part of that, right? Like, like that's what that's the power of Bitcoin is it empowers us to take control of our own lives. And and you could do this in your own community, in your own place, in your own country. Like we'll do our best to share best practices with you and to share materials with you. 
but you can do it and we could we will do our best to to help you do it uh if you want to you don't need to you just download it from github and do it on your own don't tell us it, it doesn't matter it doesn't matter whether you work with us or not like we're we're happy that it happens so do that reach out to us if, if you want help there um find it and the way to reach out to us again on our on our website uh which is myfirstbitcoin.io or me from redbitcoin.io find us on twitter so that's my first bitcoin underscore and and then expertise so beyond money what we forever need is expertise we have really really bold ambitions which is to radically reimagine the world right and and we believe that that bitcoin education we will be the foundation for for reimagining what's possible so because we have such grand ambitions so el salvador is focused but the mission is the world because we have such grand ambitions we need expertise in everything so if you're great at something you're a great curriculum developer you're a great web designer you're a great graphic designer and and you want to you want to help that way then then also reach out to us and that's another good way come to El Salvador so we're actually going to have a a charity auction dinner on July 19th uh so that's hosted by by Max and Stacy they're going to they're going to help us auction things off it's at this great restaurant it's it's the first Salvadorian restaurant to to win an international food award um so they're hosting us and we're hoping to create a physical representation of one of the pillars of our mission which is to create a common ground for bitcoin education that we could all come together and agree that this is a good thing you come at bitcoin from different angles for different reasons but a rising tide raises all boats and good bitcoin education is that tide right so we hope to make this an annual thing this is this is something that we're doing this year um one of one of the things that will be auctioned we're going to auction a whole bunch of different things and and this will hopefully give us some runway and some breathing room to to continue to accelerate our growth we have a uh, we have one of these bitcoin diplomas that that Sebedim has has done us the honor of of uh of writing a dedication to whoever wins that auction uh there's going to be we're going to like trickle out more more items as as we get closer there're going to be some really cool stuff and again uh we want to create that physical space we want to make this an annual event and and we want to have have some more some more financial security and and runway to continue to 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 push the envelope and and push this forward so so i know that's a very long answer but there's a lot of different ways that people could help and they could help us specifically they could help their own community they there's just so many different things that that people could do this is this is this is the time when we could reimagine the future i i really think that we're at a crossroads here and i know that every generation thinks that they didn't have bitcoin yeah they they, they were stuck bitcoin. with fiat so they didn't have bitcoin like this is real this is don't if 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 you think the world could be better then make it so and if you want to work with us to do that then we are overjoyed to do so yeah um i should also say i mean i think uh, the fact that you've educated so many students is a huge testament for the quality of your material the fact that it continues to uh, get used so i strongly recommend people check it out um for their own educational needs you know if you want to uh, orange bill your kids your friends your neighbors your cousins I think this is uh, this is an excellent way to get started because it's something that's been tried. You know, if, if when when you're buying a product, generally the best thing you want to go with is something that has a lot of reviews from satisfied customers. And this is what we have here. So, a lot of people have done the guides to Bitcoin. Yours is one that's uh, been out and tested in the wild. So, I highly recommend it and um, you know, it's available in Spanish, it's been translated to English. and you can translate it to other languages as well so take it and make the most of it and let us know if you end up using it for something interesting and fun exactly yes it's great awesome well john thank you so much for joining us today i appreciate your time and appreciate everything that you're doing thank you so much for having me and i i look forward to seeing you again in el salvador i hope so too cheers yeah cheers take care